Welcome, everybody, to episode 38 of Haunt and Cold Podcast. We are your hosts. I'm April. And I'm Katie. It feels really weird doing that because I feel like by now they should know, but then some people start not at the yeah. first one. Yeah. I still cannot believe that people still have not even told us whether 36 was thumbs up or thumbs down. That tells me out of all our listeners that not one of them made it to the very last two minutes. <laughs> yeah. We asked you guys to do something at the end of episode 37 and none of you have done it yet. Yeah. None so of you. What the hell though? So we feel like no one cares. I feel ignored. <laughs> and I feel not listened to. <laughs> right. Right. <clears throat> like, hello, is this thing on? Yeah. I mean, it's fine. But also, <laughs> it's fine. If you would like to now listen to us, I'm simply asking for a thumbs up or thumbs down on episode 36. We've had a lot of anxiety about it. It has a lot of listens, though. Have you seen that? It does. But I also just worry that it's angry listens and not, like, good listens, oh, you know? Like, get a hold of these guys. Yeah. <laughs> Gonna listen. <laughs> listen to what these idiots have to say, <laughs> you know? Yeah, hopefully not. Mm. I mean, we haven't gotten any angry messages. No, we haven't. But I also don't want oh. those. I just want, I want right. a thumbs up, thumbs down. Simple yeah. as that. Just tell us. Right. Like, send us a message on Instagram or an email at honcold at gmail.com and tell us whether or not 36 equals thumbs up, thumbs down. It's easy. Just do it. Easy. Easy as that. Yeah. You or just give us else. an emoji about what you think about it. It can, it can be anything. Yeah, <laughs> any emoji that equals what your feelings are. Though, right. just make it so we know what that means. <laughs> right. Be descriptive <laughs> with your emojis. <laughs> right. Right. That'd be nice. Right. Oh, but we have a new Patreon. Uh, Remember? Oh, have we not talked about this yet? No. Oh, shit. Yeah, we do. Welcome, Melissa to melissa to our patreon um she is our aunt and yes. she is cool and she <laughs> is probably the one who's gonna judge us the least she's the one that talks to us still at the barbecues <laughs> yeah she's like she's down to clown <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> what is that even? <laughs> hold on i gotta look it up on it urban dictionaries sounds- sounds like an insane like an icp quote as a way of saying yes that expresses genuine excitement or happiness yeah yeah melissa's down to clown <laughs> always yeah yeah i'd say anyway. uh what do you got going on what are you up to what are you doing oh um everyone's gonna get really sick of me saying this but i'm going to disneyland <laughs> again yeah, I'll be in Disneyland when this airs. Uh, but don't worry. It's going to be the last time for a long time. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. The only reason why we um have gone so much in the last year is just because we got uh, season passes mm-hmm. for a year pass. And, like, we probably won't do that again. Um, oh. We did make so it. So does it expire a year after you get it? Yeah. I see. Yeah, so it expires the end of February, so we're going to make this our last trip for our season passes, but also it's it's quite expensive to take mm-hmm. the fam, so we're it'll probably be like an every other year type of vacation, but yeah. Yeah, we, we love Disneyland, but it's definitely pricey, so mm-hmm. this last trip, we're excited to go see the new... Um, Minnie and Mickey's Runaway Railroad in Toontown. It's really Mm. cute. We went on it in Disney World, but they're just barely opening the Disneyland ride. Oh, fun. Yeah, it just barely opened last week or something. And then they are updating the Splash Mountain to be Princess and the Frog. 
And then they're doing improvements to Indiana Jones, but Indiana Jones is closed for a while while they do that. So I remember that one being fun. Yeah, that's the best one of all all the rides, I think. But yeah, anywho. Well, that's exciting. Hope you have fun. Hope the weather is good. It's gonna be warmer than freaking Utah. My goodness. It was four degrees when I woke up this morning. Four degrees and zero here. Inside of our door, like on the inside of our front door, ice. Seriously? Yes. Whoa. It was weird. I've never seen it do that before. You must have like a humid house. Like for there to be moisture, for there to be ice, you know? Oh, I don't know if it's humid or not. I don't know. It was icy oh. inside for some reason. What are you up uh, to? Do you well, have updates with life? I'm just destroying my bathroom downstairs because <laughs> I'm trying to update it. <laughs> The demolition's uh, the best part. Yeah, it's it's the least expensive part. I'm excited yeah. to see how it turns out to be, though, because your plan sounds really good. Yeah, I'm excited, too. I think it's really going to turn out good. That's yeah, all we... I have going on. Well, should we get on with the show? I guess. <laughs> okay, here. Let's see. I did these notes yesterday. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Oh. Can you hear me? Yeah. Am I freezing? No. Well, what's funnier is that it took me a while to realize that you're frozen. So I thought you were. <laughs> no way. <laughs> no, you're frozen. <laughs> Katie. Oh, I hear you. (laughs) My story is about Ronnie Lee Gardner. Do you know who that is? Ronnie Lee Gardner. Tell me what era this is. 80s. No. Okay. All right. Ronnie Lee Gardner was born January 16th, 1961 in Salt Lake City, Utah. His parents were Dan and Ruth Gardner. He was exposed to a very difficult and dark childhood. He was the youngest of seven kids, and his father was an alcoholic. Um, His father, Dan, uh, left the family for another woman when Ronnie was just a toddler. At two years old, Ronnie was found roaming the streets of Salt Lake City with bare feet and a diaper. Like, no kidding. Yeah. At two years old? Two years old. So CPS took him and he was sent to foster care for a little bit and then eventually was returned to his mother. So like his mom was not, she didn't give a shit. <laughs> she where was were just, the other, where were the other six kids? Doing the same thing, just roaming the streets. So it gets worse. Um, oh, okay. Majority of the time. His older sister was the one who took care of him, and he later said that he was only five years old when his sister and her friend sexually abused him. (gasps) Yeah. By six years old, Ronnie was introduced to sniffing glue and huffing gas. When he was nine years old, he and his siblings would frequently run away from home, and they would sleep on the streets with the homeless community and used drugs and alcohol. And by 10 years old, he was addicted to drugs. And his parents even allowed him to use drugs and alcohol in their home. So, oh. like, rough and parents Scary. didn't really care. Like, his parents were just, do what you want. I don't want to deal with you type. Um, That's so sad. I know. Um, As he grew up. Punishments in his home were always physically violent. He was stubborn and refused to cry or conform. Um, By his teens, he began a life of crime. Him and his brother, Randy, stole a pair of cowboy boots and authorities sent them to juvenile detention. The authorities called their father um, to come pick them up and Dan 
their dad. Um, when he got there, he only picked up Randy. Randy. <laughs> Randy. Ah, he only picked up Randy and left Ronnie behind. So okay. why? Because <laughs> Ronnie and his dad had a very like toxic relationship, and Dan would tell him that Ronnie wasn't his, and that like he didn't have to care about him because he wasn't his kid. So that is so sad. I know, and it's not freaking Ronnie's fault. Like no. Ugh, but that that was his relationship with his dad um wow yeah so ronnie's mom eventually got remarried to a convict named bill lucas he would take the boys with him to be lookouts when he would rob homes so bill oh lucas's crimes were always like robbery and bur- burglary and he would take his kids with him <laughs> was like and have them be lookout yeah come and do this right so ronnie actually idolized bill because bill basically included him like treated him like i mean it was for like selfish purposes like um come be the lookout while i rob but he felt like he was you know being included in something and so like someone paid attention to him yeah and he was like pretty and wanted him around yeah and he was excited kind of about his lifestyle of being a thief like going and taking what you want type of thing mm. um ronnie was committed to the utah state hospital in provo when he was 11 years old um <clears throat> so like his his Demeanor would change from happy and charming to a terrifying, enraged child out of nowhere. Like, he would just be night and day. So, Dr. Craig Haney, a psychology professor who I believe evaluated Ronnie down the road, he said, Mm -hmm. quote, his parents had essentially given up on him. They put him in a mental hospital, and he didn't have a mental illness. He was in a terrifying place. There were children who were psychotic, children who exhibited bizarre behavior, and he was physically small and immature, but not mentally ill. So Haney said by 11 years old, he had been in detention 12 times, and he'd live in a series of institutions. He no longer felt comfortable at home, and he didn't feel comfortable in institutions either. He really felt like he had no place in the world. So Ronnie would be incarcerated at the state industrial school on and off for several years as he continued with criminal behavior and drug use. Once he was in custody at this school, um, he was about 13, 14 uh, once he was in custody <clears throat> at the school, and um, a man who befriended his brother Randy began visiting him. His name was Jack Stat, and apparently Randy was living with him. So when Ronnie was released from the school at fourteen years old, Jack became his foster parent. Okay, who is this guy? Just a random guy that his brother Randy was living with. Oh. Yeah, so let me tell you about Jack for five seconds. He was gross. Um, he would dress as a woman and go to state offices and um, during social worker observations. He would dress as a woman so that he could be assigned foster children for the checks from the state. And when he'd get foster kids, he'd basically pimp them out. Yeah. So What? Yeah, so he was. Is it really that easy? In the 80s, probably, yeah. Or I guess this was 70s. Yeah, but like, they. I mean, like, to go in. <clears throat> it's, 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 oh my gosh. So at the but time, he was like in under disguise as some random person. It's like, so just giving kids to anybody. Yeah, and at, so at the time, foster children would. They would they were only allowed to go to women. If there was a single man, that was not allowed, but they could go to a single woman. Hmm. So the I guess I didn't put it in my notes, but the social worker that did the interview with him did write, I think there 
might be men dressed as women. But there weren't any investigations into anything, and they were just sent foster kids. I hate this. I hate it. I hate that this happened. I hate how many children were abused because of that. Well, foster, the foster system is horrible. You you either get parents who are loving and want to be, you know, a place of love and support for these children who've never had it, or you have the other side of parents who want it for the checks and can give two shits about the children that they're supposedly supposed to help and like the system is so messed up because there are way too many kids in the foster system for one um but also the homes that they're sent to are unsafe it's just the foster system is so messed up i don't i mean there's an answer to make it a better system. I just don't know what it is. And I've never been in it. I've never been exposed to it. You just hear all these horror stories that there has to be a better way. Mm-hmm. Um, right. So anyway, so he ended up living with this horrible person. And eventually right. Ronnie did say that um, Jack um, forced him into prostitution as well. Um, (laughs) later Ronnie met a woman um, as he got older he met a woman named Deborah Bischoff and they ended up having two children together they had a daughter on March 23rd 1977 uh, when Ronnie was 16 years old Um, a son on February 9th 1980 when Ronnie was 19 years old in that same month that his son was born on February 25th, 1980, Ronnie was sent to prison for burglary. He was in the maximum security prison for not even a year when he escaped with another inmate on April 9th, 1981. Whoa. Oh While gosh. he was on the run, he went after a man he believed raped Deborah, his baby mama, right? Mm. He found the man um, at his sister-in-law's house and stabbed him. Then he got in a shootout with a man named John Mitchell. And in the chaos, Ronnie ended up getting shot in the neck. He was arrested while he was trying to hide in a truck after the shooting stopped. So he got shot. He hid in this truck and then he was found and arrested and brought back to prison. (laughs) Seven, Seven months later in December 1981, he ran from a visiting room so he was in a visiting room at the prison and he ran from it he scaled one set of razor topped fences then an officer shot him with a shotgun and took him back into custody so he tried to escape holy cow didn't quite make it whoa um and That's just crazy. like when he was a kid ronnie often went from his violent temper to like a pleasant kind demeanor Um, And he would have conversations with the guards and officers in the prison and ask them about their lives and, you know, just a decent dude. And then randomly he would like attack one of the guards and one that he like had conversations with about their families and whatever. Um, He just like, he just like, he was just crazy. Did he he have, I mean, you might say it later, like, was he diagnosed with like anything that would explain that um yeah but it's down the road um and it does a like point back to his drug use as a kid um and just his life experiences you know well yeah i'm sure his brain didn't have time to develop but i mean he never had a chance to even be a kid right um In 1984, officers were removing Ronnie from his cell and he just attacked one of his friend guards with a screwdriver. Um, Yeah. And so eventually they started realizing, okay, he's he may be just being kind and pleasant to like, so we'll get our guard down and not like think he's a threat type of thing. So that would be scary. Yeah. Well, I. I don't personally know this person, but Josh knows someone from or that he grew up with that worked as a prison guard. 
and they deal with some of the roughest people obviously and it takes a toll on them mentally as a prison guard like like a lot of his friends that he worked with at the prison have ended up committing suicide really like that's how rough of a job it is during another incident ronnie led a prison riot in 1984 also he barricaded a cell block and started fires he headbutted an officer and had to be subdued with a stun gun so he is a troublemaker like he just i was just gonna say like it sounds like he's like will not go down without a fight (laughs) yeah he and he's he's determined to get out like yeah determined to get out august 6 1984 ronnie began vomiting violently in his cell and said he needed to go to the hospital he was loaded into a prison van and taken into or he was taken into a prison van he was loaded into a prison (laughs) van and taken to university of utah hospital um which is downtown salt lake as they were waiting for treatment, Ronnie assaulted the transportation officer that was guarding his room. His name was Don Levitt. Mm-hmm. And he hit him so hard in the back of the head that uh, Levitt almost lost consciousness. And then Ronnie took his gun. Officer Levitt tried to follow his demands to unlock the shackles to free him as quickly as possible. Ronnie leaned down and said to the officer, quote, I guess you know that if the doctor comes back, I'll have to kill you both. Oh, my gosh. Officer Levitt had no choice but to undo his shackles and let him go. Um, so Don Levitt's injuries to his head were so severe from his attack that he had to have his entire head and face reconstructed with titanium rods and a wire. Whoa. That's how badly... What did he he hit him with? I don't know. I didn't say. So once Ronnie was free, he ran to the parking lot and bumped into a man named Mike Lynch. Uh, Mike was a medical student and um, was just walking into the hospital. And he pointed the gun at Mike's back and ordered him to give him a ride. He said, quote, I don't want to kill you, but I have nothing else to lose. He took Mike's clothes and motorcycle and went on the run. A large manhunt began. Officers from neighboring precincts also joined the search, and they searched for Ronnie for months. For months? Months. Yeah. On October 9th, Ronnie walked into, so the next month, so it was before he was caught, okay? Um, Mm -hmm. On October 9th, Ronnie walked into Cheers Tavern in Salt Lake City, where a man named Melvin Otterstrom was working at the bar. After Melvin closed the bar, him and Ronnie got into a fight. Ronnie decided that he would rob the bar, and according to him, he the gun just went off in Melvin's face during a struggle. But in his face? Uh-huh. But according to medical examiner and the police, there was no evidence of a struggle at all. The evidence shows that Melvin was lying on his back and Ronnie pressed the gun against his nose and shot him. Which, of course, Melvin died instantly. Um, My goodness. Yeah. Horrible. Um, And he and Ronnie left with only $100. So he did that for nothing. Like, chump change. It's awful. Okay. It's infuriating. Mm. And according to the family, they told Deseret News that Ronnie even attended Melvin's funeral and pretended to be a childhood friend. Are you kidding? How effed up is that? Like, I think that doesn't even that's that sounds like he is he is. I don't even know the like sociopathic. Right. Yeah. That's so twisted and horrible. I know. Can you imagine? And no one knew who he was. But yeah. his killer was at the funeral. And just like making small talk with everybody. Oh my gosh. Okay. Ronnie was found at his cousin's house and arrested for Melvin's murder and the robbery of the Cheers Tavern in November, making his life on the run last only three months. 
Apparently, Ronnie never even left Salt Lake Valley and no one spotted him. So all these, wow. you know, police groups and whatever were <laughs> searching for him and he was just like walking around town like he's a pretty ordinary looking guy but mm-hmm. with how brutal this was you'd think that he would have been caught sooner if he was just walking freely um Unless, do you think that he put on some sort of disguise maybe maybe like a hat and glasses or something yeah yeah i could see I that did. yeah so while he waited for his trial for this murder he was in a maximum security cell uh and ronnie created a plot to escape from a courthouse <clears throat> during his trial on april 2nd 1985 ronnie walked into the third district court in salt lake city at about 8 45 a.m for a day of testimony on the murder trial as officers and inmates were there for court they walked from the basement parking garage so they pull in to a parking garage just so they can transport the the inmates to wherever they need to go um i see and as they're walking to the third floor an officer saw something in ronnie's hands and yelled run he's got a gun according to eyewitnesses either a woman slipped the gun to ronnie as they passed by because for some reason how this freaking building was set up was that just the general population of people were allowed to be in the areas that inmates were passing through. So dang a woman, someone saw a woman slip him a uh, something. Um, but another person testified that uh, they thought they saw a, that someone taped something to the drinking fountain. And that's where he got the gun is from oh. that. But Either way, someone got him a gun, right? And it's one... so scary. <laughs> right? Again, like, why are people talking to prisoners? Why do they have telephones? I know, right? I don't know. I don't understand. If you're in the maximum, um, what is it called? Maximum security. How do you have yeah. freaking communication with anybody? Communication with people. Like you get, but I don't know. I guess it's a humanity thing, but like, there's a reason. Was it humane with what they did? Right. Like, there's a reason. Yeah. And with how many times he's tried to escape, you'd think he'd like have limited communication with people. And how he just turns on people randomly. Yeah. Like, he's sketch. He's unpredictable. He's a walking hazard. Right. So there were the officers that were like transporting the inmates. One of them left his post and ran out of the building. The other oh. officer shot at Ronnie and Ronnie got shot in the shoulder and he ducked into a records room. Um, In that room, there was attorney Bob Mar- Ma- Macri. Ma- yeah, Bob Macri and his colleague, attorney Michael Burdell. Ronnie pointed... Mm-hmm. The gun at Bob first and then at Michael. Bob later testified that he genuinely thought that it was an April April's <sighs> April Fool's joke. I can't talk. Um, because it was on April 2nd, and just this guy dressed as a prisoner had a gun and was, had a bloody clothes, and they were like, Oh, this is a oh. funny joke. So they really didn't Wow. They, they were like, Oh, funny. <laughs> but <laughs> Anyway, Bob wait, got- wait for his brain to like shut down and like <laughs> not be traumatized. You know right. what I mean? Totally like, just like wow. Trying to deal with his like trauma. Um that's insane. Right. So they init- that was that was uh Bob's initial thought. Um but then once he realized what was happening, um Bob got down and ran out of the room and that's when Ronnie shot Michael in the eye. Um oh my gosh. Yeah, once Bob got out of the room, he heard the gun go off and he screamed, police, help, murder. And he's like, he said in an interview, he said, I swear, like, I got, I went crazy after that. Like, he just couldn't compute. Get thoughts? <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, that's so scary. Right. Um, Ronnie left the records room and ran into uh, the Salt Lake County Sheriff's bailiff, Nick Kirk. So, Nick um heard the heard the sh- oh my gosh 
Nick heard about the shooting and ran down five flights of stairs to protect his judge because his main duty as a bailiff is to protect the judge, right? So if there's shooting happening, he's got to go and find the judge and keep him safe. Um, So as he's running down these flights of stairs, he bumps into Ronnie and Ronnie shoots Nick in the stomach and (sighs) Nick falls to the floor. Does he die? I'll get there. (laughs) Okay. Uh, Ronnie went down to the second floor and approached a man filling a vending machine. Uh, He pointed his gun at him and asked him for a ride. As they walked down the hall, there was an open window and the vending machine guy jumped out of it. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Yeah, he was just like, I'm out of here. I mean, like, that's brave. That is, I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't do that. It was the second floor. But I wouldn't even think of it. I don't I don't know. I would think like, oh, I'm gonna make the like was the window open? Yeah. Or was it like okay. Cause I was thinking like if it was like closed, like I don't think I would have enough like foot power to break the window. So it's like <laughs> a failed attempt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If it's open. Yeah. Yeah. So it was But open. even still, like, mm-hmm. can you get to the window fast enough? Can you get out without the being fast? shot? Yeah. Yeah, can you make the landing? Mm. What's below you? Like, oh, that's brave. If you're scared, if you're scared that he's going to kill you, then maybe you wouldn't, you'd take that over whatever that guy's going to do. That's true. Wow, quick thinking though. Right? Anyway, tell me what happens next. Um, Okay. Um, So the guy jumps out the window, and then at this point, Ronnie had a gun wound to his shoulder, and his gun only had one bullet left in it. So at this okay. point, he's like, okay, like, I can't do anything <laughs> in, in my situation. So Ronnie dropped the gun and surrendered to the police on the lawn of the courthouse. Wow. Yeah. So he just went on this chaotic rampage for no reason. Yeah, um, it seems like every every attempt he does, like, it escalates. So like where him or other people get hurt and then he just goes back to jail it's like but really enough no. right <laughs> this is this is a little extra like he does he just keeps like going through these theatrics and then gets put back in his cell like he just like gets his energy over like he gets his energy out and then he goes back to jail and it's like mm-hmm. okay but then just stop letting him out of there like don't yeah. take him places. Let him be where he Like, have the hospital come to him. And if they can't, then, oh, well, that's just fate. <laughs> yeah, don't they have medical at the prison? When well, I they... watched Prison Break, they did. But I don't know how real that, <laughs> that really is. Ronnie was, after he surrendered to the police, he was taken to the University of Utah Hospital in serious condition. He was treated for his gunshot wound to his shoulder. And he was fine. Um, Michael Burdell, who he shot in the eye, still had a heartbeat, um, but no brain activity at this point. Oh. Um, he was pronounced dead 45 minutes later during surgery at Holy Cross Hospital. Oh my gosh. Um, bailiff Nick Kirk, who he was, sh- <laughs> I'm sorry, who he shot in the stomach, was taken to LDS Hospital in critical condition and went into surgery. He survived but would deal with the damage from his injuries for the rest of his life. <clears throat> um, the courthouse was on lockdown after the chaos um, because obviously the authorities knew that someone had to have help, help him get a gun, you know? Yep, um, exactly. <clears throat> so during their search, they found a bag of men's clothes under the sink in the woman's restroom. Um, his girlfriend at the time, named Darcy McCoy, was his getaway driver after he robbed and murdered Melvin, who he uh-huh. went there for his uh, testimonies, right? So right. she was suspected of being an accomplice. So she... We're recording you. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I had to check. <laughs> um, <clears throat> she was found about a mile from the courthouse and was arrested. Her sister, mm. Karma, was also arrested. Um, mm, karma be- bitch. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh, so she was also involved in, um, so she was the one who put the 
bag of clothes in the bathroom for him so she's also in trouble um darcy agreed to be a witness for the state for the trial um about this event and testified against ronnie so she i think got a plea deal um for helping the state uh, or the prosecution karma on the other hand got eight years in prison for planting the clothes in the bathroom and relaying messages to and from those who would help him escape so she was the one who would go to the prison or call him and would talk to him and get the information for the escape so i got a lot of my information from stacy lee um who's the host of dining with death on youtube and okay she did a really good job in telling the story but she was saying that um so her dad's an attorney and Mm -hmm. or was at the time at least and her dad said that she asked him about this and was like hey um do you remember anything from this time And he's like yeah I kind of do remember that um and he's like but what I really remember is that this incident at the courthouse changed the way they transported prisoners to and from court really (laughs) yeah so completely changed how secure it was it wasn't so like lenient and they didn't let like commoner common people just wear you know they're transporting people ronnie lee gardner was sent back to maximum security at the utah state prison he prepared for his trial and he in preparation he was evaluated by a psychiatrist who would diagnose him with antisocial personality disorder. So that was his his diagnosis. I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't really know exactly what that is, but I assume that means that he just doesn't care about other people. Let's look (laughs) it up. I should I should have put it in here. Let's look up the definition at least to get an idea of what that means. A particularly challenging type of personality disorder characterized by impulsive, irresponsible, and often criminal behavior. Someone with antisocial personality disorder will typically be manipulative, deceitful, deceitful, reckless, and will not care for other people's feelings. Jeez. It's sometimes called sociopathy. Okay. Yeah, sociopath. Um, and in June 1985, Ronnie pled guilty to the murder of Melvin Otterstrom. Um, so that was the bartender that he killed and was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. But then he had another hearing, obviously, for the courthouse event. And mm-hmm. Ronnie said during his hearing, quote, I didn't have to kill anybody. No one done anything to deserve what happened. Um, at the trial for the courthouse chaos, um, on October 22nd, 1985, the jury deliberated for less than three hours and found Ronnie Gardner guilty of capital murder of Michael Burdell, um, mm-hmm. which is the, the attorney. After the sentencing hearing, the same jury deliberated for five and a half hours to decide Ronnie should be put to death for killing Michael Burdell and injuring bailiff Nick Kirk. <clears throat> okay. Um, November 1985, Ronnie chose the firing squad for his method of execution, which makes him kind of a popular or a well-known person because, again, the firing squad is not a common choice mostly uh, puts them in the headlines yeah because you know it's just not common and but it's still on there as an option so they have to is it still today yeah wow but they have to do a bunch of stuff like i'll 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 talk you through about it for a second but um he told the judge quote i prefer to die of old age your honor but if that ain't possible, I'll take the firing squad. Um, so if prisoners choose this method, like we learned with Gary Gilmore in ep- episode 12, the state mm-hmm. is required to do a series of appeals to be able to move forward with that choice. Um, they have to kind of jump through a bunch of hoops and go through all these things to see if they, one, should even... <clears throat> If they if they choose firing squad, maybe instead of firing squad, they could just have life in prison and die in prison. Uh, 
and sometimes they think the appeals will take so long that they never really get to that point of the firing squad Mm -hmm. you know you look like you're on fire yeah why do i look like that all of a sudden is your house in flames no it's just this candle right (laughs) here but like it wasn't red before no it wasn't there you go oh there you go okay I guess it's too late. We're already so far in. I don't need to filter. I'll just be ugly. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I mean, like, I'm not saying you are ugly, but I don't think a filter is going to change anything, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I, the filter won't fix how ugly you are. It's fine. Okay. So, yeah. So, like I was saying, um, the state is required to do a bunch of appeals and see if they can move forward with this method of execution, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Which, fun fact, Utah and Oklahoma are the only two states that still offer firing squads as a method of execution, yeah. Um, Utah and Oklahoma? Yeah, everywhere else it's only Mm -hmm. lethal injection. That's interesting. Yeah, and the reason that... um, Ronnie chose firing squad is because he said there was less likely to be uh, a mistake or that it it's like a, a for sure thing like you get shot you're gonna in the heart you're gonna die mm-hmm. but with lethal injection there's been situations where people haven't uh died or it's been a slow death type of thing um just with how they you don't know until you you don't know until you get there right so, Dang. um, anyway, what about night- execution? Oh, they don't do that anymore. That's like long gone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh. I I wonder when the last one was. Hold on, <laughs> we're just gonna I just test the of, like, internet. I always think of like the goofy movie where they're like, and they'll give you the electric, the electric chair. chair. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So when oh. I was a kid, I'm like, oh man, that is like top punishment. Like you go to jail. You get the electric chair. (laughs) The electric chair was used quite frequently in post Greg versus Georgia executions during the 80s, but its use in the United States declined in the 1990s due to widespread adoption of lethal execution. In 2021, South Carolina turned back the clock and became the only state in the country in which person may be forced into the electric chair if he refuses to elect how he will die. What? <laughs> oh. In 2021? Yeah. Like either you choose or we choose for you and you're not going to like it. Shit. As of 2022... The only places that still reserve the electric chair as an option for execution in the U.S. are Alabama, Florida, South Carolina, Kentucky, and Tennessee. Yeah, so it's still around, huh? Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Crazy. Okay. Sorry. I I just think that's so fascinating. Okay. Mm-hmm. Anyways. Um, anyway. Anyway. 1987, while waiting for his execution, Ronnie had a lady friend visit him in prison, which, like, uh, Stacy Lee, <laughs> during her episode, she was like, I don't understand how these men still have women coming and going. Like, it's so yeah, weird. What are they, they going to get? What, what are either of them going to get out of it? Well, this guy got something out of it because as they were talking through the glass, Ronnie suddenly breaks the glass partition and grabs the woman and begins just undressing her (sighs) and the other inmates see what's happening and they start blocking the guards from getting to him and they're rooting for him. Ronnie and this woman just freaking have sex in front of everybody. What? And yeah, it took a few minutes for the guards to actually get to him and take him back oh to his my cell. Gosh, I would hate to be <laughs> one of those guards. Right? Oh, how horrible. Yeah. Blech. I know, but like nasty. Can we just, can we just and say And what about like, other visitors? There were other visitors, right? Oh yeah, there were What are they doing? 
watching, I guess. Could you imagine being <laughs> one of them? I'd be like, ah. <laughs> oh, oh, no. wrong place, wrong time. <laughs> he has he has this completely like oh. effort attitude. He's just like, <laughs> I'll yeah. do whatever I want. Cause he's like, I'm gonna like be balls to the walls. Who gives a yeah. shit? Well, because he's about to be executed and there's literally nothing worse. <laughs> so I mean, live like you're dying, him. right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So yeah. Anyway, wow. um, I don't know. About so that. I know, right? In 1994, Ronnie got dr- got drunk on prison toilet wine. <laughs> what? Yeah. So they made wine in their prison toilet, and he got drunk off of it and stabbed his cellmate nine times with a shiv he made from sunglasses. His cellmate survived. There's but- so much to unpack. There. I, know. I know um but so his cellmate did survive but they still tacked on the assault charge to his list of charges even though he's being executed um yeah oh so gosh, i wonder that's... how gross prison wine prison toilet wine is uh, i mean yeah so I'm, I'm sure they're using like the tank i don't know where like you'd the fresh so. water is you'd hope so you'd hope so well i don't even think it's a regular toilet it's a bowl right what are they how are they doing that <laughs> i don't know they'll That's find disgusting. a way they find a way always toilet wine have you seen orange is the new black yeah they find all kinds of ways to do things That's they're not true. supposed to i'm like you know how we were talking about going to that like wine tasting thing <laughs> yeah what if that's like one of our critics we're like i'd rather drink toilet wine <laughs> than this <laughs> i'd rather drink prison toilet wine than this <laughs> yeah in 1996 well, i know it's insane <clears throat> in 1996 ronnie said he was going to sue the state of utah if they didn't honor his request to be executed by firing squad Though defense attorneys took on the case and said he couldn't be executed by firing squad because he had brain damage from all the things he dealt with in his life. He had meningitis meningitis at four years old um, that I guess can have complications or like uh, lasting effects from that. Huffing gas Mm -hmm. and glue at six years old, drug addiction at nine years old alcoholism at 10 years old sexual abuse neglect and malnourishment mm, yeah so oh, during a break all that makes me so sad mm-hmm. like for his youth you know i know like little ronnie you want to just like mm-hmm. i'll take you and take care of you or i'll you know that's all he just he needed he just he just I wanted that's love. all he needed was someone to step in and like care yeah and he never got that but I don't think it's he would have even, I don't think he would have accepted it at a certain point. I think he would have just been rebellious no matter what. Because he was, he <sighs> yeah, was gr- like. kids are just like that. Well, I mean, his entire life, that's how he lived. So even if you, you'd, you would have had to intervene at like two years old. Yeah. Um, when yeah, CPS took him. him the first time, they should have found him a new home at that time, I think. I mean, you'd, you, you wish you could turn back time and just like give him that opportunity at two when CPS Mm -hmm. first took him away from his mom. Like he, if he would have been with a loving family at that point, how would he have turned out? Cause he had this, um, what is it called? This antisocial personality disorder. Is that something you, through experiences, gets worse? Or is it something you just have at birth and he would have turned out to have a difficult life anyways? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, would he have turned out any different? Yeah. Like, would he have turned out different? Um, Or would he have ended up um, having the same outcome eventually? I don't know, but you can only imagine the kind of effect those those things would have had on him, especially with yeah, um, at such young ages. It's insane. Okay, yeah, that's so sad. 
I so during his execution pardon hearing I believe so they're still trying to like decide whether or not he's even going to be executed now because he chose firing squad uh Ronnie mm-hmm. stated that he had changed it was uh he said in 1999 after several psychological evaluations they served as a form of psychotherapy and it helped him gain insight into the damage he's caused he said quote I didn't want to change um I fought for it I fought it for a long time but I finally accepted it and that's the good thing about change you have to really look at the damage that was done he said he accepts the horrifying details of what happened to him something he's always downplayed like it wasn't a big deal um he's come to grips with how he destroyed families and people that he'll never know He Mm -hmm. said, quote, I'm embarrassed. I'm ashamed of it. When I look back, it shocked me. He became a counselor for other inmates. He wrote a letter to Oprah Winfrey asking for a donation to start an organic farm at the prison. He then, yeah, he then changed his mind. He didn't want to be executed anymore. He said, I can do a lot of good. I really believe that I can be a good example. There's no better example in this state of what not to do. the board of parole listened to his arguments and all the evidence and they ultimately decided that his sentencing would stand Mm. yeah so interesting yep um so the prison authorities had to use a manual written in 1985 to know how to even do this right because they don't do it very often since it's a rare method uh, they had to kind of use this manual as literal instructions on how to perform a firing squad execution. That's scary. <laughs> right. Um, so there was this concrete room with, it's, you feel like, <laughs> I felt like it would have looked different, but I guess they don't need it to look like aesthetically anything because it's just a concrete <laughs> room. Mm-hmm. And it's a black wooden chair against the wall, and it has a strap for the head and two straps for the feet, and then straps for the arms on the armchair or the arm rest, whatever. Okay. Um, and then there's sandbags behind the chair and to the side of the chair, so, so that over. well, so that it while um when they shoot that there's no ricochet or um. It just kind of catches everything. I see. The wall he's facing, he's looking at, has like these, um, so it's all concrete still, but it has these like slits in the walls for the rifle barrels to be like rested on it. Mm -hmm. Um, And then they're all aiming at his heart because they put like a, they put a target over his chest, over his heart. And that's where all the riflemen are aiming. Um, mm-hmm. There's five random anonymous rifle handlers. Um, four of them have live rounds and one of them have a blank round. We did talk about this in the Gary Gilmore episode, but yeah. um, we can go over it again. because it's Which is crazy because in my story, I'm also referencing that same episode. Oh, you are what are the odds. Uh-huh. That's funny. So twelve. That's so funny. Um. Yeah. So yeah. So four of them have live rounds, and one has a blank round. So none of the people shooting know whether or not they were a part of killing him. There's always a question that they're like, "I could have had the blank round, right?" right. Um. So Ronnie Gardner would have a tar. Oh yeah, a target over his heart. Um. And then they would instruct him or ask him if he has any last words, and then he'd be hooded. They'd count down, and then they'd all fire, right? So <laughs> that's kind of like what's in the manual that they're like following. Um, 24 hours before Ronnie was to be executed, guards move him from his cell to a death watch cell where he has his last meal. Um and I forgot to look up what his last meal was. I want to say it was scallops, but I don't know if that's real. <laughs> Hold on. Ronnie Lee. Interesting. Bard. 
our last meal. <laughs> Sorry, hold on. He was watching the Lord of the Rings trilogy while he was eating his last meal. I don't even know what would be going through my head during that time. Like, you would have to just, like, be as positive as you can, but I feel like I'd be having a total meltdown. Right. I was about to be executed. Last meal. His last meal was steak, lobster tail, apple pie, vanilla ice cream, and 7-Up. Why would you mm. choose 7-Up? Yeah. Uh, he watched, oh, so 48 hours. <clears throat> um, okay, sorry. So on June 15th, 2010, he ate his last meal, steak, lobster tail, apple pie, vanilla ice cream and seven up and then he <clears throat> sorry and then he did a 48 hour fast um watching lord of the rings and reading divine justice um and he said his fast was motivated by spiritual reasons hmm. huh. anyway okay um <clears throat> Weird. sorry um, he was able to visit with his family. Um, he had a few chosen visitors that he could kind of say goodbye to. Um, he didn't want his family to be there for his execution. So instead, they ha- held a vigil for him. Um, I think it was across the street. Um, and they played Leonard Skinner's song Free Bird during the execution time. And on June 18th, 2010, Ronnie was changed into a black sh- jumpsuit, led to the execution chamber, and strapped to the chair. The curtain was pulled back so the execution witnesses could watch, <clears throat> and he was asked if he had any last words, and he said, I do not know. Ronnie was hooded, and a target was placed over his heart. The rifle safeties were flipped off. The executioner said, ready, aim, fire. And the five gunmen pulled their triggers. Yeah. Ronnie's hands Ugh. clenched into fists. He sat upright. He began to relax, but then he tensed again. And then after a few seconds, his body fully relaxed. Ronnie Lee Gardner was pronounced dead at 12, 17 a.m. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. Um, that is just <clears throat> the worst, awful, I don't know. I feel so like conflicted with how I feel. I know it's one of those things where where like it is graphic to hear his last moments, but then you think about it and you're like, okay, well, is this justice though, or is this inhumane to where like maybe he deserved it, or maybe maybe like. The lethal injection is more humane or maybe you know we shouldn't offer the death penalty like it makes you think all these things where it's like that's a horrible way to die but also look at all the horrible things that he did and killed people for a hundred dollars or you know what i mean um yeah exactly so it's it's hard and i think most people wrestle with this like tug of war i guess with their morals <laughs> if mm-hmm. ex- if um you know the death penalty should even be allowed but honestly like i think about it and if i was one of the victims like families you'd also be like yeah of course he deserves to you know be executed but then like does that just make it a revengeful thing like isn't yeah. it isn't it more like um torturous for them to be locked up for the rest of their lives and like waste away in a prison or but then well, they get three meals a day and then they get reading time and gym time and you know like they're yeah. in a safe place they're not suffering but 
it does surprise me at least who they like who ends up mm. on death row and who doesn't you know mm-hmm. like there are so many crimes that I feel like are just as bad as his that the person didn't end up on death row and it's like why you I kind of think it was because it was an attorney and like mm-hmm. he was well because he got life in prison for Melvin the bartender guy um, but Michael, the attorney that he shot at the courthouse, um, I don't know. Maybe it's because it was the place and the person. Yeah. I don't know because but there's like so many crimes that I think like are worth the death penalty. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like that's what I'm ch- thinking. It's like, like pedophiles. <laughs> yeah honestly right. i right. think that's worth a death penalty and you hear sentence. they get like 14 years of until parole or something and it's like yeah and then they what? freaking get released and do it immediately after like there's no cure for that i'm sorry but there isn't which i don't know if that should be taken out but i just think that's personally i think that's a crime that i think should be under the execution list right like off with their heads right but that's coming from a mom two moms right Mm -hmm. but like i think everyone's under the same thought process though because like because they knew better well child abusers sexual or physical in prison when they when other prisoners learn of their crime they are targeted because even mm-hmm. prisoners think that that's inexcusable so it's like right. yeah i think it should be under that list <clears throat> right like that's if we're just all on me. the same page then we all agree it's bad yeah let's just let's just put it on there let's just yeah i agree make it a thing same, okay same boat yep okay so utah executions are primarily or were primarily performed at the Utah State Prison in Draper, Utah, which has been closed uh, since July 2022 and has moved five miles west of Salt Lake City International Airport, which I'm like, why did you put it so close to the airport? If someone escaped, you just hop on a plane. I mean, I know there's there's way more to going to the airport but i mean if tom cruise can hijack a plane (laughs) (laughs) right like i just feel like that's a really weird location well it's also closer (laughs) to like the intersection of the west you know like you know how i-80 and i-15 intersect in salt lake city they moved it closer to that so it's literally on (laughs) i-80 yeah yeah it's like if someone were to escape, they could be in any direction within five minutes. Yeah, which is like interesting. Brilliant. Interesting choice. Thinking. Why not send it to Beaver? Like, yeah, in the middle of the freaking middle of nowhere. nowhere. Yeah. Or Dugway. Let the aliens take them. <laughs> yeah, for <laughs> real. Uh, yeah. So, anyway, the um, <clears throat> it opened in July. Which I didn't know it already moved. Maybe I'm just not paying attention to life. Yeah, you're behind. Um, but they moved roughly 2,400 inmates to the new prison. Um, <clears throat> November 29th, they began demolition of the old prison in Draper, Utah. And the first domino to fall was a guard tower. Really? Um, yeah. Which, fun fact, the land authority voted... To save the prison's small 61-year-old chapel by the wayside that was built by the inmates, <clears throat> which was hmm. a result of the 1957 prisoner riot where they demanded a proper place of worship. Interesting. Um, yeah. So they're saving that as like a good landmark, which I think is really cool. Yeah, um, watch all the ghost hunters go there too. <laughs> That's what I was I was in my notes. I'm like, we should do a ghost to hunt over here. Um, yeah. But the state is also preserving the prison's antique central locking system, known as the Johnson Bar. It's a relic of when the state lockup first operated in Sugar House, and there's only one other like it in the country, and it's at Alcatraz. 
Really? Yeah. No shit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, basically the Draper prison is going to be demolished and they're going to make it a community called The Point. Yeah. It's going to be all fancy shopping park. centers, parks, houses, because we don't have enough people freaking living here. And um, then they're also going to do <clears> the <throat> baseball park, too. Is it going there? Somewhere nearby in Draper, so. Oh, but it, is it going at this, The Point? Not exactly the... sure. Oh, we should look it up. They just barely announced that they're moving it that to the Draper. Bees are moving to Draper. I just don't know where exactly, but yeah, me either. Anyway, that's my story. Wow, that's a wild one. Yeah, I didn't know about this guy until I read read about him. Like, yeah, just barely. About... That's just so sad. Like, it's just like you know. Just like, take was, care of the kids, you know? Like, was he a product of his environment? Or was he, was it his diagnosis, like, from birth? Like, like I, I guess I don't know enough about these psychological disorders or anything to know if it's, like, a, they're always this way or would have been this way mm-hmm. anyways, or if it's a product of your environment that creates this disorder i don't know well i would definitely see that his environment didn't help you no, know made it worse People can I, still be yeah. born with that and not end up being sociopathic murderers yeah so i think i'm leaning more towards his environment is what caused it because i think he just didn't have a chance to be nurtured the way he was supposed to be Well, and I'm just, like, so mad because I just think about his, like, parents. And, like, some people shouldn't have parents or shouldn't have kids. Yeah, right. That he was the youngest of seven. Right. That family had seven kids. Mm -hmm. For what? And they didn't didn't watch after them because you said the oldest ones were, like, essaying. Yeah. Ronnie. Yeah. By five years old. Yep. That's so sad. And him and his brother, Randy, were in and out of the, whatever it's called, the juvenile detention. So Mm -hmm. he just, they didn't care. Right. And the only person, anybody up. And the only person that semi cared is the one who taught him how to be a thief. Right. So so sad i know it makes me really upset i feel like every kid deserves some fan or parents that love them and i just make it makes me sad that so many people don't get that right not even the basics you know right like we think we have issues because you know we dealt with we didn't get a furby yeah (laughs) listen (laughs) uh but yeah like problems people have it so much worse but it's true okay uh yeah let me get my story yeah let's change the subject okay i have kind of a short story this time okay so here it goes (laughs) so i'm covering layton hills mall really yeah hmm so we're going to Leighton, Utah. The exact address is 1201 North Hillfield Road. And I don't know if you guys remember, but back in episode 12, I covered Kay's Hollow. And I mentioned that Kay's Hollow, Hobbs Hollow, and Leighton Hills Mall um, apparently make like a equilateral triangle right. of cursedness. <laughs> yeah. So... <laughs> Yeah, so this is one of the locations. So eventually I'll cover Hobbs Hollow. Okay. Um, so a little bit about the mall. Back in the spring of 1980, what used to be the 20-acre Layton Hills trailer park became a two-level mall with three main department stores, uh, ZCMI, Castleton's, and Our Box. Hope I'm pronouncing that right. 
Um, but between 1987 and 2017, several department stores have made their way in and out of Layton Hills Mall. I was going to go through and do like the history of like, oh, this store was here from this year to this year, but I didn't think it was important. So I just skipped it. Um, Close the door. In addition to these different department stores coming in and out, uh, there have also been renovations happening just to keep the place looking updated and modern, as yeah. you would expect with any retail place. Right. So I know we have some listeners that are from that area, so I'm just going to list a few of the stores that have been at Layton Hills Mall, just for nostalgia reasons. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there was the Bon Marsh, J.C. Penny, Meyer and Frank, Macy's, Mervyn's, Dick's Sporting Goods. Um, and I guess there was also a sports a sports authority at one point too, but I hmm. didn't put that in my notes. Okay. Um, sort of fun fact. In the summer of June 2020, it was announced that JCPenney would be closing its store as part of its business plan to close 154 stores nationwide. But apparently that store, that location was miraculously saved from that chopping board list. Um, So they're there to stay for now. Hmm. So, Yay for JCPenney. Yeah, who knows how long that's going to (laughs) last. Right. The mall has now, the mall now has over a hundred stores and the upper level is where you will find the food court with classic food chains like Chick-fil-A, Dairy Queen, Hot Dog on a Stick, and Subway, plus others. Mm -hmm. Uh, The lower level is where they have an interactive aquarium called SeaQuest. Also on the lower level, they have a a kids play area that was sponsored by Weber State University. Oh, that's cool. So this may seem like an ordinary mall, but it's rumored, not confirmed, that it was built on an ancient Native American burial ground. I mean, is there all been... of Utah? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I was thinking that too. Like, anybody could say that. I feel like, you know, yeah. like it's all... It's all not ours. <laughs> so, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, so it's not confirmed. It's just rumored that it's been built on top of this burial ground. Right. Um, there have been stories of paranormal activity ever since it first opened. Really? Yeah. I read several stories of former employees who have worked at the mall, and they say that the stories are all true. And things definitely happen here. Stories from the cleaning crew and security guards about experiencing paranormal activity in the middle of the night. They said that potted plants will relocate themselves when you're not looking. What? And when you look closer, the dirt from the plant has been disturbed or dug up and usually spilled onto the ground. Oh my gosh. Do they have a golden retriever somewhere? Yeah, right. Or like like a gopher. (laughs) <laughs> well like uh um Corey's house his dog just his tail swishing just <laughs> makes all their plants on the ground like oh my literally gosh. there's dirt everywhere because of his tail it's <laughs> so cute but <laughs> I can imagine that would be so frustrating <laughs> but it's probably not the case at the mall no um, security guards have claimed to see shadow figures walking up and down the halls after hours, as well as hearing voices echoing against the glass windows. Mm. So you know, like the sound of like someone trying to talk like through glass. Yeah, that's what they were hearing. Oh my, that's kind of scary. Yeah, I mean, I used to work at Southtown Mall. And closing was the worst because not only was it creepy and like the, because you'd have to go break down boxes and you'd have to go in the hallways that are like behind the stores. Yeah. So like I worked, only employees. I yeah. There too. <laughs> yeah. So like you, you go through these halls and they're eerie as shit. Like they're so yeah. creepy, but um, <clears throat> that was scary. But also just going to the parking lot at night was scary mm-hmm. for its own reason. 
But yeah, it's eerie being in a in an empty in a mall. Mall. Right. Yeah. And like, you know, like we can get into a whole discussion about this, but like you know how they talk about like energy having effect for like how you feel in a room. Yeah. Like I wonder if like that weird feeling is because like during the daytime, like the energy is so high and like vibrant that when the lights are turned off, it's like, wait. It's, it's like so, stunned. Yeah, it's like so you know? still that it's yeah creepy, but it's just because the energy's down. That's what I oh, wonder. Okay, I can see that. That's my theory. Hmm. But I mean, some places really are creepy as shit. But like, oh, right. I could see that being the case. But I don't know enough about like energies to like have a real opinion about that. But that would make sense to me. Like that explanation yeah. kind of makes sense to me. I think. But oh, yeah. What I was saying though is that like some places truly are just creepy. Like, Mm -hmm. But those places usually are creepy during the daytime, too. Like, it's not a daytime-nighttime thing. It's, like, just all the time. It's just that nighttime amplifies it. And where both experiences were from, like, the um, cleanup people. Cleanup crew and the security guards. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Um. Some employees have said that when they've closed up their stores late at night, or even sometimes when they're opening up early in the morning and they're alone, you know, just inside their stores, that the mannequins will move on their own. Oh, if I saw that, I would have quit. (laughs) Yeah. I would have quit so fast. Wouldn't that be so scary? That would be the creepiest thing in the world. Mannequins are freaky looking anyways, but like... Mm -hmm. Moving on their own? Nope. 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 Um, they said that they will change position or the clothing will shift without anyone touching it. That's scary. Don't you um, wish there was like a uh like a security recording of it or something? Yeah, it's like, where's love- the footage? <laughs> like, I know. Like you experience this. I mean, I guess uh a 17 year old person working at the mall isn't going to be like i need the security footage for (laughs) this morning at 7 a.m um there's no crime but something happens and you need to let me see it but any manager that would say no to that is lame as hell i know you shouldn't even be working there any that should be a good tester like if that happens to you ask your manager to see the footage if they say no or if they act weird, they are not for you. That no. place is not not for they you. They don't have. They don't pass the vibe check. They're at in all. on it. Yeah. <laughs> or they'll say, "Oh, our security cameras haven't worked for years, but they're just there to prevent people from stealing." Which, oh, yeah, yeah that's likely. That's honestly likely. <laughs> Even in twenty twenty three, that's likely. right. Um, I read stories where some employees will come into their store in the morning and find that some of their merchandise has been completely rearranged overnight. Are you sure you don't have someone living in the store? Yeah, or like the security guard, like secretly shopping, you know. (laughs) Or the person who closed was like, whatever you did, I'm going to (laughs) undo. Yeah, like I (laughs) Like, we had that when people would redress mannequins because they didn't like how you dressed it. Oh, so they would yeah. redress them when you were, when they, they were their shit out. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that too. And blame it on a ghost. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Must be haunted. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> like, Jessica, this is the fifth time you've done this. You need to clean up after yourself so the morning crew doesn't have to do it for you. It wasn't me. <laughs> it's the ghost <laughs> uh, okay also Just try that to if you. you if you work if you work at the mall <laughs> mess shit up and say it must be a ghost it wasn't me i don't know <laughs> yeah. throw the ghost under the bus <laughs> especially if the person that opens is like a friend and you can be like it was a ghost i don't know looks like you gotta clean it up <laughs> yeah. yeah i like this yep okay i can we can give you a bunch of tips of working at the mall <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. 
or just working with anybody i guess <laughs> yeah, yeah. we can tell you exactly what not to do but tell you to do it anyways yeah how to be at the night crew <laughs> yeah right all right so employees in the stores have also experienced items being thrown off the shelves when no one's around so like you know like the classic story of like a book being thrown off the shelf like they'll see like their stuff being thrown off shelves isn't that they, crazy? they see it yeah with their own eyes with their own eyeballs. or with someone else's eyes just kidding. no <laughs> not transplanted no but i do i remember at the old store before they moved across the hall uh yeah um when you worked at forever young yeah i thought you froze for a second because you were like oh (laughs) i was was, um waiting traveling (laughs) back in time oh do you ever do that just like think like oh yeah that's that's where it was like you had to like get to put yourself there to like know what you're talking about but we always had like shoes that fell off the shelves that were on the walls you know but but it was probably because the The shelves sucked or the neighbors and the other store like hit the wall or something but they see it with their own eyes yeah that would freak me out too and also not worth 825 no well that was that was my raise 725 (laughs) that was your raise (laughs) <laughs> isn't that the sad part <laughs> yeah i started at 7 25 and i worked there for almost three years and i left at 8 25 isn't that the saddest you were thing in the proud world? of that too I and remember. i was like i'm making good money yep i can yeah. afford gas and fast food <laughs> i know i can actually freaking get something other than a dr pepper at freaking mrs fields <laughs> uh but you know that was back when mcdonald's still had like a dollar menu like a true dollar menu. But McDonald's wasn't at the mall. No, I just mean like in general, just being oh, able yeah. to afford things. Yeah, that's true. The economy. Inflation. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Don't get me started. Like, <laughs> if I started a job at 725 now, like I wouldn't be able to afford getting food at McDonald's. How sad is that? Yeah. But minimum wage has really to come sad. up a little bit. With the inflation, like it has Didn't to. It? I don't think. I think it's still at seven twenty five in Utah. Is it really? I think so. Let's see. I what thought it came up, gonna... but maybe it was like a bill. They're like, please pass this. Then who knows what happened? Well, they that. tried to raise it to fifteen or something. That's what I. That's the last thing I heard. Yeah, it's still seven twenty five. That is shit. It hasn't they come up. Of hot, stinky shit. It hasn't come up since 2008. 2008, really? What was it before? Huh. In 2008, it was 655. Wow. So it went up 70 cents in 2008, and it hasn't come up since. Okay. That's... That's enough. That's not all right. If you can't, <laughs> you can't even get a combo meal for seven twenty five. <laughs> it's like if you can't afford to pay your employees, and you can't afford to have a business. I'm sorry, you can't even get a full <laughs> thing of freaking, you know those huge egg things. Those are yeah. over eight dollars. You mean like the twenty four, like the five four yeah. dozen? It's twenty something dollars, dude. Yeah. But the, so the, the, okay, so there's like the huge, count. huge cartons, and then they have a midi carton, and then they have their regular yeah. dozen. I the regular dozen about. right now, I just bought for $5. So That's four, pretty cheap. $4.80 or something like that. For 18 For 12 Oh, for 12 Doesn't it say 18 for 12 the, the smallest size? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, sorry. I thought that you were talking was... about the next one up. No, the midi, I think, is about $9, isn't it? Yeah, that's 18. what I bought the other day. It was eight eighty eight. Yeah, and then the big, huge, huge ones are like 18 to $20. And so you couldn't even buy more than a dozen eggs for minimum wage right now. You would have to work yep. two hours 
to afford that's before tax before the taxes so after all the taxes come out you'd mm-hmm. have to work two hours to get 18 eggs that's so sad that is awful what I'm they should do is really just bring up. down the prices of eggs well inflation just needs to come down altogether. <laughs> like, yeah right not just the eggs but like literally everything would be nice yeah then you can keep minimum wage where it's at if everything else is cheaper. Right. But with where the prices are right now, minimum wage has to come up. Even yeah. to $9. Like, it doesn't even have to go mm-hmm. up to 15 Why can't it go up to $9? Mm-hmm. It needs to stay at least in pace with 18 eggs. Yeah. <laughs> 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 The price of eggs should determine what minimum wage is. Right. That's mom politics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If I have to work two hours for a carton of eggs, despicable. I will, yeah, like, what? Anyway, that's horrible. It's fine. We're just, <laughs> we spent a lot of time on how offended we are by minimum wage (laughs) right it doesn't even affect us anymore we're just like (laughs) how dare they 16 year olds aren't out buying eggs but still yeah that's true and if they are good for them good for them (laughs) they know they know their priorities (laughs) eggs you raised a good child it's a really great source of protein it is Unless they're buying it to throw at people, which I don't think people do anymore. No. We lived in a time where we would attack our enemies with eggs and toilet paper. And now no one can afford eggs and toilet paper. (laughs) And then call them right after, like, look outside. (laughs) (laughs) But we spent our childhood Uh, doing that. Yeah. Stacy was always our getaway driver. It was not eggs, but the toilet paper. Yes. Right, we we didn't do eggs. No, so I was like actually putting damage on people's stuff. Yeah, we just littered. Yeah, we just did toilet paper. Oh, okay, gosh, sorry. Days. I know, huh? Okay. And it took me the longest time to learn that that was a mean thing to do. I know, because we. Would I thought always... it was. I thought it was to show someone that you like cared <laughs> about them. <laughs> like, hey. We're friends, and I just did this to you. Like, you're on. Like, you're it. <laughs> you yeah, know? you do that to your friends, and then they do it to you. Yeah. That's how we grew up learning it. But come to find out, you do that to people you don't like because <laughs> they. <laughs> have we to... played the game wrong. <laughs> yeah, we're like, maybe that's why we have no friends is because we toilet papered them all. <laughs> we we read the room wrong. <laughs> yeah. They're like, hey, look outside. And they're like, what did I do to you? You're like, ooh. Like, you, know how they say, you know how they say, like, kill them with kindness? Yeah. <laughs> like, we were probably told they for so many times that, like, our mom was probably just like, it's okay, honey. It just means that they like you. Let's just <laughs> do it to them back. <laughs> right. We're like, okay. That's what you do with friends. It's fine. Yeah. But really hated us. Oops. Oh. It all is coming together. <laughs> well, to be oh, fair, boy. we just toilet papered Taylor's cousins and her dad. And her dad, <laughs> Stacy's <Stacey's> ex-husband. <laughs> <laughs> Looking back on it, it's pretty funny. <laughs> oh, I forget. I for- we did that a lot. <laughs> we toilet papered his house a lot like we knew exactly like okay you get the tree i'll get the bushes <laughs> and you get like the lights you get the the door like we like we knew our posts <laughs> there's no way he didn't hear us though we were loud as like, we could <laughs> giggling be. we were laughing so playing hard. music oh yeah 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 why did we yeah. play music so loud in the jeep <laughs> i don't know i don't know those are the days. We weren't uh, stealth by any means. We didn't know how to do no. things. Didn't know how to make <laughs> friends. Didn't know how to treat friends. <laughs> didn't know mm-hmm. how to be stealth. It's fine. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. <sighs> what am oh. I reading? Where am I? <laughs> I uh, okay. Hmm. We just went on a tangent. 
some people have experienced the lights turning on and off on their own, as well as being touched with no one being around. And interestingly enough, I was going to put my notes, but I ended up not. Um, The people who mentioned that they had been touched, they all said it was in the back. Like they got touched in the back. Isn't that weird? Like the back of the store or like on their back? No, like on their back. Oh, okay. So I don't know. I feel like when like one thing is the same, it's like, why? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, employees have said that drawers and cupboards will open and shut on their own. And employees have said that another weird thing that has happened is that the phone will ring and when you answer it, nobody will be there. But if you go to look at the, like the phone record or like the incoming call list, uh-huh. that call won't show up. Weird. Like a ghost call, completely a ghost call. Um, I saw what there's a weird sound behind me. Is it a ghost? It sounds like Cooper's eating his bone right behind me, but he's not in the room. Weird, unless he's right at the door, and I don't know how to hear things in the right amount of space. (laughs) Maybe, maybe like the direction of sound is weird. Yeah. For some reason. I don't know. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I saw a video where someone was being interviewed inside the mall. And I believe that she was talking about her daughter who worked at the mall and like talking about her experiences that she's had, like her paranormal experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, she had like a whole list of things. But one thing that she said uh, that wasn't out of the, that was kind of out of the norm was that her daughter once saw an apparition of a Native American woman um, with a very large headdress on. Wow. Isn't that interesting? So it kind of like ties in the rumors about it being possibly built on top of a burial ground. So it's like, well, because why else would she see that? You know? Right. So unless she's lying... But I just, I'm going to assume that she's not. So We're going to be trusting people. And we're going to yeah. think that this is real stories. Right. But yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, I would imagine that it's either a burial ground or just the place of death or place that they lived or attached to. Because mm-hmm. it could have even been just like a place where they lived. Didn't yeah. have to necessarily be a burial ground for it to be haunted. Yeah, right? that's true. Yeah, I would think so. They don't have to, like, because they even say, like, spirits don't typically visit their bodies after they're buried. Like, they go to, like, the places they lived or, you yeah. know, like, the places they spend their time. So I don't think that that would be too crazy to think that it wasn't a burial site. It was, like, like you said, like, maybe a village or mm-hmm. something like that. Yeah. Hmm. That's the end of my story, though. That's cool. I I wonder if anyone that listens has been to or worked at Leighton Hills Mall, if they have experiences, you should send us an email. Yeah, I'd love to know. We'll or any mall. Out. Just tell us about your mall stories because they yeah, cool. mall stories are dope. Working at the mall, even though it sucked in some ways, it was a fun time as a teenager to work at the mall. I yeah. felt like I worked there as an adult. That wasn't as fun. No, I can't imagine that being great. But as a as of like my first job, I liked it because then like I was I felt as a kid you feel like an adult because you're like mm-hmm. working and then you can go spend your money. Which I didn't. Yeah. I was very scared of spending my money for some reason. But unless it was on food. I valued food <laughs> more than putting clothes on myself. But yeah, I don't know. You were you were pretty nicely dressed in high school, better than I was. But I, I was would... always jealous of the clothes that you had because it came from like your store, and it was just like the it fashion, you know. Oh yeah. And here I was wearing like 
Walmart or like Gen X or whatever that freaking store is called. Oh my gosh. The amount of clothes they got from Gen X and it was just the worst quality. Like all camisoles or they were just like regular t-shirts. Right. But that's just what I got because I didn't have a retail job. I worked at the gym. So you worked at Forever 21 and I was jealous of some of your Forever 21 stuff. Really? Uh Uh-huh. Did you know I was so mad at Forever 21? I'm sorry. Let me just like shout them out real quick. I worked there for like a temporary position. So I worked there from like November to like January and I got like this awesome discount. I got paid kind of a lot for working there. Mm -hmm. And I remember they said in the beginning, they're like, yeah, you can wear like pretty much anything that's in fashion, you know, just nothing that's like ripped up or like just be professional with how you're dressed you yeah know? cool so I go shopping at forever 21 and I get this really cute do you remember that like light blue California hoodie <laughs> type yeah. thing that I had mm-hmm. I wore that to one of my shifts and they sent me home to go change I was so mad because I'm like, like I got this here idiot yeah they're like yeah that's too casual and I'm like it's I mean, like, it's a hoodie, but it's, like, in style, like, you know, it's not, like, a hoodie. It's, like, it was, like, a, it wasn't, like, a, like, a slouchy hoodie. Right. I was so mad and embarrassed, because I was, like, you know, 16, 17 is one of my first jobs. I got sent home for my clothing, but I got there. I I was so mad. That's (sighs) so embarrassing. I'd be so pissed. I did yeah, remember I the, my only rule was <coughs> um, I had to wear shoes from the store. You worked at Forever oh. Young. Yeah. Shoe store. That's now still there. Anyways. Um, but <laughs> I worked there for many, many years. Uh, and my rule was I had to. I don't remember if I had cl- rules about my clothes necessarily. Like, I had to be able to bend over and not show my butt. Because, like, you'd have to yeah. get shoes out. Like, cleavage and stuff. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I just had to wear the shoes from there. But they only gave you, like, a week to buy shoes. Dang. And I was like, oh, shit. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, well, thank you, everybody, for listening uh, to episode 38. This airs on February 5th. So, the next one airs on... February 19th Mm -hmm. and so in between that is Valentine's Day and the Super Bowl which Mitch's team is part of the Super Bowl go Eagles he is so excited I told him like does that mean we can have a new puppy if the Eagles win because that's what (laughs) we did the last time they won is we got Philly oh (laughs) so I was like do we get a new puppy and he's like don't tempt me (laughs) We, we probably won't but Anyway, go Eagles and go Valentine's Day. Hopefully, hey, everybody playing eats chocolate. Against the Chiefs, right? Um, is it the Chiefs? I haven't yeah. looked. I didn't see who went, won the game. Probably, think, and that's Josh's team. Oh, really? Well, not like his team that he's obsessed with, but like as a kid, that's who he chose. Hmm. Was the Chiefs, and it's All just right. been someone he pays attention to. Yeah, so we'll see who wins. I don't think Josh is. Super yeah, we'll see. Ex- I mean, like dedicated or anything. But... Right, like it won't change his life. Yeah, he won't I'll go probably... get a dog because of it. Yeah, <laughs> I'll probably cheer for whoever wins. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> uh oh, and also by now, another on Deck at Dusk episode has been released. Yeah. So join our Patreon to get a scoop of that. And that can you can join for as little as four dollars a month. That's our lowest tier. Biggest tier is six dollars a month, and that's where you get the, the small business shout out, which we've talked about in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, follow us on social media. If you liked this episode, share it with your friends and family, and add us in your story if you choose to share it there. We'd also love a review or two. A review. A four to five star review. (laughs) Um, (laughs) That's all. Yeah. Thumbs up and oh, emoji 
reviews of episode 36 we also want that or of any episode if you just want to yeah. tell us an episode you're listening to and you want to send us some emojis about it that's fine that's, that's fine. a great thing we should start doing if you're too afraid to tell us the truth please just send us your emojis about how you feel and we will understand we will yeah. we will get it yeah. it won't hurt our feelings no matter what you put even if you give us I don't know what's an offensive one the poop mm. sign emoji. yeah poop sign we'll say oh man they thought it was the shit <laughs> <laughs> yeah we'll turn it around to be positive no matter what it is <laughs> yeah we could we can do it <laughs> yeah. so like no matter what you send us it won't hurt our feelings we'll just accept it so we just want it yeah it will hurt That's our all. feelings but we'll pretend it was positive <laughs> we'll cushion it as much as we yeah can. <laughs> exactly but yeah be honest it's fine yeah i mean with four or five star reviews because that helps <laughs> us yeah. be honest but like gentle be honest Don't but nice right. be honest but lie to us if it's mean <laughs> Yeah, because like even though honesty is the best policy, kindness is also free. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> I love. I don't know. <laughs> ask for feedback, but then we're like, but only, only positive feedback. <laughs> Conditional. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, oh, that's all. Okay. Well, see you later. Yeah. Bye. Oh. Okay. Mm-hmm. Bye. Hey. Bye. Mm-hmm. <laughs>